uh, I guess I can start then. So my name is Nika Anjenla. Uh, I am a founder, producer uh, of Horizon Studio. Uh, this is a production house. We produce projects in the creative industry. And I also host, I'd love to ask questions. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is me with different hair. <laughs> um, so today's discussion, um, you can already go to the other slide. Yes, it's about unconscious bias and its effects. Uh, um, because I think we all know about unconscious bias and, and a little bit about its effects. We all talk about diversity and inclusion for many, many years. But for me, it was important to really zoom in, but why are we talking and keep talking in cycles? So we'll talk about the why, we'll talk about the how and the what, how to implement it. So why DNI? Um, I think it's pretty clear for everybody by now why it is important. I, I can repeat it, I can say it in many, many different beautiful words. And I've even listed it out, you know, better output, creative teams, better reach, uh, more sales. So I think this is clear. Uh, I met this organization in 2019, uh, and I was working on a project called Project uh, Theater Inclusive. And I gave this presentation in Bulgaria. And then after Bulgaria, I went to Scotland, and now we're here. And um, it's something that I noticed over these yeah, two years, and that's that the conversation is the same, the exact same. And this was shocking to me because I thought, oh, so in the Netherlands, we have the same conversation, the same rebuttal argument. In Bulgaria, we have the same uh, conversation, but somehow nothing is changing. Somehow we're not solving anything. And um, I started to ask myself questions and self-reflect, but I also started to ask these questions to other people. Be honest with me. What are your fears? Why do you think DNI is uh, hard to implement in organizations? And um, like one of our biggest shortcomings is our unconscious bias. You know, 95% in the video, it said 90% of decision makings, but it's 95%. Uh, is unconscious uh, and 5%, only 5% works consciously. And um, it also mentioned that we start to assume because we, we work on this autopilot, right? We start to assume things about people we just heard or we start to assume about uh, images or imaging of people. So this is how we tend to work and think about others. Uh, and I started to list down, okay, but what are the effects of this, you know? Uh, what do we mean when we work in autopilot next to, you know, uh, being uh, discriminatory or other effects? Uh, I also noticed an important uh, sign of ourselves and that is we forget. We tend to forget what we have learned about the other. And if we forget, I think we uh, end up or we shoot into a fear, a reactive, um, into a reactive way of fear. And uh, we tend to sit into this autopilot. So one of the things that I also noticed is uh, in society in general we start to create a disbalance so we outcast people and we uh, choose a certain average this is what i know this is what feels normal this feels good so this is what is uh, uh, what my brain accepts to be good and all the other things that falls outside of this these assumptions make it even uh, worse um, and so I got back to, you know, thinking about those two years and uh, uh, the conversations I've had with many, many, many people. And I noticed that we are not really getting to the core. 
you know, so next to the 95% and the 5%, uh, there's another thing that keeps cycling around. Uh, and this only um, causes the consequences of ideas we have about women, men, and others uh, to, be, to become uh, um, worse. Um, so one of the systems that I am referring to is the current system we have accepted as uh, uh, normal, uh, which is capitalism. And uh, actually, I wanted to see if I can ask a question to any of you. Uh, what comes to mind when you think about capitalism? Next to the things that you're seeing on the screen now, is, is there someone that can tell me or answer this question? Maybe Anne or... Yeah, I think of... Um... Unfair power. Unfair power. And hierarchy. Hierarchy. Okay. And performance. Corporate strength and greed, I hear someone say. Uh, yes. Anybody else? I can also just continue. I think, I think I'll continue with the word exploitation of labor. Ownership. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so it's not my goal to bash capitalism as a system. Um, but I do think we need to be aware of who we are as a person. We just started with that, the self-reflection, our human condition, and then also in what type of system we have uh, been living in and what its effects are. Someone says inequality, like it says on the slides, exactly. Because when we talk about equality or inequality, I think we also need to start talking about power and power structures. And uh, once we are honest about these things, then I think the conversation about uh, diversity and inclusion will become more uh, uh, in depth. Because right now, uh, I, have, I, have, I have a feeling that when we say we need more women in leadership positions, I don't think we uh, consider the fact that a lot of people have the idea that they're giving something, that something needs to uh, be given up for, in order for that to happen. So uh, let's say uh, we need 50% more women in leadership and uh, uh, most of the uh, leaders are male. I can imagine that a lot of male leaders will think, okay, but what happens to my job? What happens to my position? Does this mean that I need to give something up? And this also comes back to the power structure. So um, getting back to the unconscious bias and uh, the way we are talking about this topic, I think we need to go into the core of it. What does it mean when we talk about power? What does it mean when we talk about diversity and inclusion? And what are people really afraid of without them saying it? So there was this TED talk I heard from Baratunde and it said uh, in one of his uh, quotes, systems are just collective stories we all buy into. When we change them, we write a better reality for us all to be a part of. So we just talked about a system, a capitalistic system. We talked about uh, our, our way we work, our brain. Uh, and now I, I heard this quote and I thought, okay, so if a system are just collective stories, uh, it means we need to change the way we tell the stories, right? So uh, if we change this, this way of thinking, these things we keep repeating, for our 5% consciousness, we can also change the way we treat each other. Uh, okay, another thing that was really shocking to me because I studied uh, human rights, uh, international law. I come from a very different sector and then I uh, moved into the cultural sector and creative sector. And I thought, hey, the cultural sector is not diverse. I, 
are, are, are having troubles with getting uh, inclusive or diverse. And I, I didn't understand why. And of course, I just explained that there are some things like the human condition and uh, the system we are living in that enables that. But at the same time, I also started thinking about uh, sectors like the film industry, theater, t television, if they um, send out a certain message, you know, um, for example, women cannot work or uh, 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 people who fall for the same uh, gender are bad or whatever stories we put out there and we continue to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, we're, st we're going to believe it. And I think uh, that the cultural sector has a lot of power to change those stories because we, that's what we do. We tell stories, we create them, we tell them, and people will believe them because this is how our brain is working. This is how we are processing things. Um, so I, I started to look at the cultural sector as a tool, actually and uh, a, a very powerful tool to change uh, systems and to change the way we uh, view and create our worlds. So uh, you heard about the why, and now we're uh, moving to the how. So within an organization, we, we zoomed out from uh, the system, the cultural sector, and now we're getting into the organization. And within an organization, we also have systems. I mean, the way an organization works with managers, different departments, marketing, uh, human resources, et cetera, these are also systems we have created for ourselves. And uh, there is a structure there that is already in place and that is happening right now in so sort of a cycle. And if things are, have been the same the whole time, for a long time, people will believe that this structure is good, that this structure is normal, and that it's, it's, it's almost like an ecosystem. Um, but we're actually dealing with a social system because we are talking about human beings. And if things start to feel different or strange, at, at some point in our behavior, we uh, uh, we tend to, to keep it the same way. We don't like to change things. Um, so when we're talking about the how, the most important thing I want to say, because I, I, I don't want to be over time, but the most important thing I want to say is that we need to start thinking about changing the structure of things. Just not, not just uh, taking a diversity course here, or doing this there and then thinking that we're going to solve the whole uh, issue. No, I think we need to start thinking about how to change the full structure of how you go about things. So uh, before you do that, you need a plan because it's a big task, right? Uh, you need to create a vision. What do you want to reach within your organization exactly? Set a clear goal and make it smart you know, specific, measurable, uh, acceptable, et cetera. Uh, uh, implement a structure. So uh, for example, uh, during uh, HR uh, or during, I'm sorry, it's during uh, hiring people in, in, uh, in, in a vacancy process, you know already that if you put three male uh, employees there to uh, to look at who, who they're going to hire uh, for the next job this already creates a certain type of behavior because you have three three people who have who are the same basically who look the same or who act the same and if you have people uh, sitting there on and and judging a woman or someone that doesn't look like them we tend to react from this unconscious bias. So you need to put in a structure of how to uh, hire those new people in. But I, I'll get to that later uh, to make it a bit more clear. 
Uh, and then after implementing a certain structure or a certain habit, uh, you have to execute it, of course, because we love to talk, 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 but then putting in the action and executing it is another step. And then you will figure out that this is actually not that easy. I remember there was a, a assignment I got with, within my organization where um, we had to organize a jam session. And uh, there was this a, a colleague of mine, a partner that told me, you know, I noticed in this whole festival, there are only men, uh, male artists, and even people working behind the scenes. And since your organization is usually very diverse, I don't see any female artists. How come? Can you change something about that? And it was around Christmas time, everybody was tired. And I remember in that moment, I had a power to change something, to decide to do something about it, put extra effort to make sure at least my organization was representing other people as well. And uh, this is what I I mean with when you execute it, uh, then the real world comes up because at that point you realize uh, you have a choice, you have a power to change something. And sometimes because of workload, it's hard to, it's hard to execute. But since you are thinking from a structural point of view, so not just, oh, I need to change this because it's good, diversity is good, no, because you are starting to implement it in the DNA of your organization, then you start to execute it better and you evaluate on it. What made it harder for you to make that, make that decision? And you repeat. You keep repeating until it becomes normal. Okay. Uh, so I, I categorized, of course, um, the different departments or different ways you can look at uh, uh, the time is running a bit out. I'm almost done. Um, you can look at your organization. Uh, and in the Netherlands, we have the four P's method. I don't know if in other countries they use this as well. Personnel, public, programming, partners. Because every department or every uh, category is a different approach. And you have to set a goal per uh, category. You can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so, for example, personnel, what I was talking about when you have a, a vacancy out there and you hire people, uh, you need to look at the people who are going to judge or uh, look at uh, the person that is going to be hired. You need to look at the process. How are you doing that? Are you enabling your biases to run through or are you making sure it's a neutral process? I think I'll just touch upon each of every category. So uh, public, of course, the marketing uh, team is very important for this one. Uh, you need to target your groups. Every target group has its own approach. You cannot have a one size fits all approach for every type of uh, person. Uh, and what goes hand in hand with marketing department, of course, is the programming department. A lot of people see this as very separate things, but I think uh, uh, in the ideal world, they work in the same space, in the same office, in the same uh, way of thinking, because the way you program the people, the makers, and the, um, the programming you uh, communicate outside is, is, is the way you, wait, I need to say this correctly. Uh, the message you want to bring out with the people you use on stage or wherever is the same message you give out when you market uh, the, the play or the, the theater uh, um, theaters that you, you are you, you're marketing this program in. So partners, uh, same goes for partners. The uh, organization doesn't have all the expertise. And in order to bring in expertise and, and specialize on something, you can work together with partners to make sure that your 
not missing your blind spot. And they can also help you in programming. So the what, I already explained, you have to create a new system. And um, I, I explained in the implementation of it within each category and each uh, um, a department. But at the same time, we have days like Pride, uh, we have uh, uh, Women's Day, we have Mother's Day. There are uh, moments in, in our society where we are already celebrating these systems. But since you as an organization have a way of thinking and uh, moving and uh, creating, uh, we also need to make sure that it's implemented in in our program, in our schedule. So uh, get creative with it, work together with other partners, make sure that within, even though if your, uh, your employees are not as diverse yet, you can still bring in expertise until it is to be able to start changing the system in your organization. Um, so a question for everybody out there from me to you is uh, set a goal, create a new system within your organization. And the question is, what is your next step for implementing gender diversity in your organization? And like I said before, break it down. Don't see it as one big task, but as a lot of small, smaller tasks that has one big goal. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, we're running into the breakout sessions, ladies and gentlemen, and there are three breakout sessions. And let me just introduce briefly, Rashida Lamperitz, Lamperit, Social Front Podium Kunsten, the challenge of embedding gender equality into day-to-day -day management in the live performance sector. And she will be chaired by Anita De Beer. And then you can choose Dr. Ian Manbord from Equity UK, uh, about constructive approaches to live performance criticism uh, and then and he will be uh, chaired by Hannah Havemer and then you can jump into Belinda Steve's uh, workshop or breakout session uh, chaired by Thomas Diane. Uh, she will be introducing or talking about the methodology of Naropa. Uh, so I think the breakout sessions are now in progress. You can see that we have a uh the unassigned participants here in the main room for this session. And I think normally we have uh, Rashida and Anita here who will be leading us through this breakout session and kicking off the discussion with everybody. Great for having you with us. And um, well, we had a very inspiring <laughs> introduction by Nikki and uh, she, she took us through a lot of topics there that make you kind of think and you do that also in your daily practice in in belgium you're also running an, a specific working group with uh, people that you are trying to change this structural thinking and uh, the way structures are set up like uh, what nikki was presenting um what were your thoughts when you heard about uh, what Nikki was uh, was telling us from your daily experience, from your daily practice, from your yeah activities that you do. Yeah, well, it was quite um, uh, refreshing to to hear Nikkei's uh, um, ex 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 expose uh, what what she was doing and how she um, tackles this uh, kind of issues. In fact. I had this um, feeling that it, she talked about the scan and do trajectory that um, we from the uh, uh, performing arts social fund are doing also we have this trajectory that is called scan and do and it is similar to what you have just exposed in the uh, in your uh, lecture so um, we try to um, offer um, uh, organizations in the performing arts a, a, a trajectory uh, that that takes four years um, and that um, it has the goal to to be more inclusive in all 
in all kind of, of, of ways, not only uh, gender wise, but also uh, when it comes to ethnicity, different cultural background, um, ability, um, and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, we tackle also the four P's that you ha have mentioned, you know, you, we, we tackle the public, the, the personnel, the programming and so on. So, and, and we try to, um, to get really everyone in the organization involved. So it's not only a, a top, uh, uh, um, um, how to say it, so we do not only address the, 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 the CEOs or the directors, or we, we want to involve everyone within the organization from top to down. And we try to um, um, approach every every section of the organization so wh wh when we talk about uh, inclusivity and diversity we talk about we on, we do not only talk about the public because that is m mostly the main reason why why organizations come to us and ask us for guidance uh, to be more inclusive or to be more uh, then they say we do not reach a different public especially for organization who are organization who are situated in big cities like brussels or antwerp or ghent and they see that their the, the community, the city dwellers have internationalized, are becoming very diverse, but they do not see that diversity uh, represented in the in the in, in the in their public who are coming to attend um, um, the theater venues or something else. So that's mostly the main question for what, how can we reach a, diff, a different public? How can we reach people um, that do not come to us? Um, but when we go to them with our project, with our trajectory, we, we say that is one aspect, of course, the public. But if you really want to have an inclusive approach and, another, and a different way of, of working and, and, and creating a different narrative, then you have to tackle other uh, uh, um, uh, domains also, so also programming, also uh, your personnel, who is working for you, who is programming for you, what kind of stories or do you bring uh, on stage, which stories are not represented, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think one of the difficult things that I'm, I've been working on this um, project for now almost four years and I like Nike I come I have a, a, a judicial background I, I was a lawyer and uh, <laughs> so there is a lot of uh, common uh, uh, points that we we have so um and I, I also was very uh, impressed that um, the cultural sector was not as inclusive and diverse as I thought that they would be. So um, now we're, I'm working uh, for almost four years on this trajectory with, with different um, theater houses, mainly uh, in Flanders and in Brussels. And um, what I discover is that it is um, th the first contact that they make with us to, 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 to get informed about the trajectory is that the, the houses are very eager, very enthusiastic, to, 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 to do something, to change the, their ways. Um, but when we get into the business of, of trying to, to change something, uh, the first thing that we do is sit down, look at yourself. What are you doing right now? Uh, who are you right now? Who is at the table? Who is in your organization? Um, look at who you are really and um, what you want. And, we find it very difficult to 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 um, when we we ask them those questions to to, to get um, how to say it a very honest reaction on their on their on their self. You know, it's very difficult for organization to acknowledge that um, perhaps that the things that they were doing aren't aren't as um, inclusive as they, they think they are. So this is a kind of, uh, they get a bit um, disappointed <laughs> about the picture that they receive of themselves. So it's, it's very difficult to, to then uh, take them by the hand and try to change uh, things, you know, because it is a process of three, four years. Um, we, we want really um, not like Nike says, not, we do not want it to be just 
some anecdotic, some little changes here and there, but really that what we demand is that they reflect on themselves, on their own mm -hmm. identity, and that they really change their DNA. That mm -hmm. is exactly what is going to happen. And that implies also that, yes, the organizations is going to change a bit of identity, you know, and that is a bit... Yeah. That's Can I just ask Rashida, maybe Nikki as well, because yeah, nothing is so difficult than to change uh, people's mind because yeah, you, you, you grow into it. Is that by talking, 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 talking? Uh, or yeah, what are your, your methods in, into, or is it by really saying, by doing certain things? Or is it a yeah, well, we start, of course, we start by talking and, and by asking them, what do you want? What do you, how do you see yourself in one year, in two years? What do you, what do you think is important for you to change? And then if they, uh, they, pint, uh, they point out what, what, what is important for them, it can be that they say we want pers a more diverse personnel, for instance. Uh, then we, 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 we go with them uh, on a journey and looking, how can we reach that point then from now, within a year, within two years, what do we need to do now uh, so that you can look back in a year, two years and say, I have, I have achieved that goal. So it's, it's going to be like, like Nika said, we, we're going to uh, have some uh, goals, some actions uh, that they have to implement and that they have to work for. So it's not only talking, it is really we need some results. And we're, we're not the ones who are going to say, this is what you have to do to be an inclusive organization. They have to tell us what is possible and what, is, what, what they need and what their ambitions are so that we can work with them on very concrete action points. Um, hmm. So they can, and then of course, yep. they try to, 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 um, to implement that and, and we ev evaluate, we come back, we, we see what, how, did it work, did it not work, what were the objectives uh, were, uh, or uh, what were the obstacles, what mm -hmm. went well, what did not went so yeah. well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's an ongoing process, yes. Yeah. I think we have a question from Jörg Löwer, who is from Germany, <laughs> from the Actors Union. Jörg. Hello and uh, or a comment. Uh, nice <laughs> to hear you. Um, I'm actually not the president anymore of the theater. You yes. I finished the summer, <laughs> so I'm here on private. Uh, well, actually, I'm in between jobs, unemployed. And I just wanted to say with the presentation of uh, Nika and also what just been said, uh, since I have a lot of free time, I'm supporting causes that I'm personally interested in. And so right now I'm helping, um, I'm assisting a non-binary BIPOC artist in Hamburg with the German funding system, with uh, 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 where to get money for projects that uh, contain non-binary themes and uh, 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 racism and all the stuff. And uh, I had an evening in a German state theater concerning these topics here, diversity and inclusion, which brought me to complete different ideas of what we've discussed in recent years within FIA, for example. And that was one evening, which was like a summer festival evening for the BIPOC artists of Hamburg of a German state theater. And uh, there were two things that astonished me. First of all, uh, they organized the event not in the respectful way they would do with their white star actors in the normal procedure. It was the host didn't know anything about the artists. He couldn't explain what happened. Basically, they were presenting local BIPOC artists and I didn't get any information about these artists. So that would have never happened with the white star actors of the Fix Ensemble. And the other thing was I was queuing outside and lots of the members of the communities that were represented on stage couldn't get in because it was sold out. And when I was sitting in the performance, only 50% of the seats were covered by people. And it was the public that was there was 50 to 60 year old white uh, teachers, I would say, and young students, also mostly white. They were used to the ticketing system that you like can get a free ticket for this event uh, if you book four weeks in advance. But the communities that were on stage, they don't function like that. 
they were excluded from the classical art art sectors for so long that they're used to club scene uh, uh, to ballroom and all these scenes and they don't work like i book a ticket four weeks in advance so the evening ended that people didn't show up like the normal white middle class people who wanted to spend the night, the beautiful summer night in Hamburg in a cafe because they had a free ticket. Okay, it was for free, you know, it was a political event, but now how many summer nights do we have in Hamburg? So a sold out performance was 50% filled and the Beeper community who wanted to show, wanted to see their buddies couldn't get in. And that the whole system didn't work in the course of inclusion, representation and self-empowerment because the artists were really disappointed by the outcome that there was almost nobody watching. And that's like uh, inclusion gone wrong, I would say. And the people have to understand the systems, how to address the people they want in these, in these productions, for example. And uh, sorry for that long, but that's for me, it was an awakening process that we've never discussed. How do you get the people in that you want in the theaters? They are not used to the normal theater structure. They're coming from ballroom, club culture. They were excluded from these scenes and now they are not used to their system. Especially, for example, we're talking about systems and it's an easy thing like the ticketing system. Hmm. How do you sell the tickets? How do you give out the tickets? Yeah, you're bringing but, up a very kind of, uh, uh, yeah, concrete example, but, but which touches upon a very essen essential part of uh, um, yeah, well, what is the problem? Uh, Rashida or Nikki, do you want to react to what Jörg was saying? Yeah, you, you were talking about multiple uh, departments uh, that uh, went wrong or multiple within multiple departments, things can change, I, I, I need to say. It's a bit more positive. Um, and the last department is the marketing department. And if you have uh, a marketeer who isn't from the scene or who doesn't understand or understand the target group or isn't used to understanding this target group then already you will fall into this this issue so uh, one thing that i would recommend this organization to do is to work together with uh, other marketeers even if it's outside the company who do understand the scene and also work with, uh, um, how do we say this? I sometimes need to translate from Dutch to English, but a sleutelfigure, we call them. Key figures? Key figures, yeah. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the scenes that you can talk to and work together with so that anything you want to bring out from the programs or things you're organizing, that you talk to them and they will then communicate to the people who can buy the tickets because you need to find very different ways to reach them since they are not used to coming to your theaters or wh wherever you're inviting them to. And they're, like you said, also not used to the system, the ticketing, ticketing system. And the only way to avoid that or change that is by uh, working from their perspective. You, we tend to work from the organization's perspective a lot. We just expect everybody to understand what we are doing. You need to buy the ticket a certain way. You need to do this a certain way. You need to understand how we communicate this program a certain way. But the, the people you try to target might have a completely different way of reading things, understanding a different language, buying their tickets. It's, it's working the other way around. That's how I would advise that last part, but the other part is another approach. <laughs> Rashida, do you want to uh, comment? Yeah, I, I, think, I don't think I have so much more to add. Um, I, I see that um, uh, when, for instance, it comes to fitting and to uh, and to communication with the public, um, you, you need, of course, to know how to do that, how to reach the, 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 the that the public that you want to reach, and it's not uh, going to happen via the traditional uh, canals of communication. So you have to find out how 
do we, can we reach out to them and um, um, is there not, there are so many other ways um, to communicate and, and and what I see is that organizations are very conservative in the way they, they reach out to, to, to the outside and um, not uh, uh, because they're uh, uh, they're bad mostly they, because they, they do not know how and um, so um, there are um, in the organizations that we are um, guiding and helping um, um, many uh, interesting uh, initiatives for instance uh, uh, when it comes to ticketing, um, there is an organization in Brussels that we uh, are guiding now, um, who is uh, uh, experience, um, uh, doing exper experiments on ticket price, for instance, pay what you can, or um, kind of social tariffs that they, uh, um, they, that they um, 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 how to say it, to pass them. Eh? Um, apply yes <laughs> <laughs> apply. there are many uh, interesting um things that you can do uh, uh, when you when you really are um are committed to to tackle a, a problem uh, then they you have to use your creativity and try to get off the traditional way of doing things you know there is a whole world there are whole different worlds outside your your little world that you know and and the way you you think you, you are used to doing things you know there and that can open up some possibilities mm. Derbo, <laughs> you like to ask a question yes i would like to um so i think that um both uh, Mike and uh, rashida kind of drew our attention to the fact that um you know people are quite motivated to make superficial change that kind of feels like it could feel good, um, but that sometimes when they're confronted with, you know, the reality of, of changing their ticketing systems and, and changing everything about how they do business, um, that it can, it can feel uh, more difficult, let's say, more of a challenge. And then I wondered, um, you know, how do you kind of um, make the business case for that change because that's what businesses need to hear in the end is actually you know what's the reason in terms of the success of our business for doing these difficult things uh, some of which seem to involve for example you know it was mentioned there maybe selling the tickets cheaper so um so how does how does that work in practice when you're trying to actually convince uh people to make that kind of change well, I think that Nike already mentioned a few reasons why uh, why organizations um, are motivated to to change their ways. You know, um, I, I I think that those are are the, the the more how do you say it economic uh, reasons why to, why to do it. You know, for instance, in in Brussels, if um, if if uh, organizations do not change their their ways to 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 attract a different public to to, to tell a, a different kind of narrative, then it, it, it they will become a bit, um, how to say it, um, irrelevant, you know. Um, so that is one thing. But another another reason why I think uh, it is important for organizations to 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 make the effort uh, of changing is is a more ethic ethic reason. You know, I'm 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 a lawyer and. Um, you know, human rights are very, very important and very um, at the core of, 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 of everything, I would say. And if those organizations, um, uh, how to say it, um, um, do uh, also believe in those values and in those human rights and equality, and um, then they, they are obliged to, to change their ways, you know, because especially for, for um, organizations that are uh, funded by public uh, resources, you know, so uh, you have um, public money that is used, but is not a benefit to the benefit of everyone. So that is something that is in my mind, uh, an ethical question that those organizations should tackle. I, I agree uh, also because I have the same background, but at the same time, what I have been noticing the past two years is that this business case is actually, uh, and it sounds painful, the way to change most people's minds. 
since we are living in a capitalistic system. And uh, so, of course, the ethical uh, should be the main reason, but this hasn't been convincing up until now. But if you uh, uh, implement in your argument, well, actually, diversity brings you more money than how you have been doing business now, people are more interested because this is the truth. And um, another truth, and this is a mix between what uh, you just said, uh, Deborah and um, Jürgen, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, Jörg. Um, uh, people are afraid to not sell tickets. We, we need to like acknowledge this. People are afraid that we are missing out on the people who have been buying the tickets, that we're not paying attention to them anymore. And I've actually been ha having conversations like this with directors of big theaters, that they are afraid, um, especially the marketing department, that they won't fill up the, the, the spaces. And because it takes time to convince a new group of people that your space is now also for them. Because for a long time, uh, I didn't think theaters were for me. If I'm being very honest, I thought, oh, this is for th those type of people. It's only for, but it, it takes some time to convince me to come to your theater. And that time means loss of money. But when once my generation or my, people who look like me or who look different than the normal group is convinced and you start seeing better results, then you will make more money. But there, there will be a moment, and this is something you have to be very honest about in this business case of uh, um, decline. And a lot of organizations are very afraid of that because they don't want to take the risk. And uh, so, uh, yes, I, I hear your question. And at the same time, as an entrepreneur, you have to be very, very honest with those directors or, you know, marketeers that it's going to be hard for a while, you know. But if you keep pushing and keep investing in a bigger group, you'll get better results. But you need to see the bigger picture first. Yeah, I think... I mean, what comes now to my mind as well is um, whether you observe also a difference between, yeah, the public sector, because Rashida, you touched upon also the fact that yeah, the subsidized uh, organizations are, are struggling. Would you define or would you think there is a difference between like subsidized and commercial or private sector or it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, because I, I often also think, yeah, they're not accessing often the public funds because they're not, so they are not coming with their publics. So yeah, that's. I mean, there's some so many other things that go on um, around this. Um, we haven't touched upon it. We don't have to touch upon it. But if you want to say something, you're welcome. Uh, me. Or someone else. Both. The question is both to you, to Rashida. Um, um, so when you look at the strict definition of it, you know, the public sector and the private sector, there is a difference, we know. But we do live still in a capitalistic system. We do work with people, human beings, in both systems. So we will behave the same, even though we want you know, the, the, the government or, you know, to, to see a public system as it is. I, I know from our hearts, we really want to believe that, but in practice, it hasn't been uh, playing out like this. Uh, uh, and I think another reason for that is that the cultural sector, in, at least in the Netherlands, hasn't been funded well enough. So we are getting less and less money. And this means that more organizations are going to be competing with each other to survive. And they have to kind of shoot into this new uh, identity of uh, uh, sort of being like commercial corporation to survive, sell tickets. 
uh, instead of relying on funding from the government. So there, there is like an identity crisis happening within the public sector, I think, uh, 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 for, for the lines to be blurred between the differences of being private or public because of those things I just mentioned. So it's a, it's a lot more complex than uh, uh, do you think it's, it's the same or different? I, we know it's different. We all know that there are different definitions, but uh, the way we operate makes it problematic. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Rashida, <laughs> from your Belgian view then, <laughs> what's your experience? Yeah. Well, um, from my uh, opinion, I think, I think what Nikkei says, it's, 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 it's true, I, you know, um, we are all um, dr driven by a kind of uh, market logical uh, thinking. Yeah. So, um, and whether it is the public or the private se sector, it's, that is the, the thing that is uh, keeping the, the, the organizations going. They have to oblige to, go to that logic. So, um, but what I was trying to say about the, 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 the organizations that are funded by um, public um, money is that they have, they have a, a, in my opinion, a much bigger uh, uh, um, obligation to, to, to conform to, uh, to human rights, to equality, to not that private orga organization uh, uh, do not have to oblige to that, um, to that um, um, obligation, but it's 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 different. It's it's different in my in my opinion, um, um, and also you know the, the the fact that we have a changing demography um, will force any organization, whether it's public or private, to really take that change into consideration to if they want to stay relevant if they want to have a public if they want to sell tickets then they have to take into consideration that the public is uh, changing and that it's uh, diverse and that um, and that they have narratives that they want to be seen represented and if that is not if, if that's not not happening then the, those organizations have a problem yeah There we go. <laughs> to react to that because I think um, I think it would be interesting if you can comment on um, you know where do you actually see the good practice then because on the one hand you have the public organisations and I think um, you know Rashida is really right to point out that they have a different uh, obligation kind of from a societal point of view. Um, that you know they they are funded by public money and to some degree they have a kind of a public mission um, and uh, I absolutely you know agree with that but then I wonder you know if there is also this business case where is the good practice that you see is it in the public sector where you know we have this public mission or is it things that are arising by themselves that are more grassroots that are that are not actually driven um, you know, by public investment, um, but actually by a real desire to kind of connect with, with a diverse community. So, so where do you actually see change happening, I suppose? Um, there is a lot of change, of course, but it's, it's on a very small scale and um, we, we expect the world to change overnight, but it's not going to happen, of course. But what um, I, I've been working now with um, not only me, but my my colleagues also from the social fund uh, with an organization in Brussels and um, they are doing interesting things and they are also um, funded um, and the the big change changes that are occurring now in that organization are start, started uh, at the moment when the old director of that organization left and um, <laughs> And there was a new direct direction in, in place, and it were it it are there are two women who are uh, in charge now of uh, that organization, and um, you see that they are really committed to really um, change the organization to open it up, and to to really um, 
um, how to say it, to, um, to um, share their power because um, that is what is happening. You know, they have, um, they are, they, they have all these resources that they can, um, that they can use at their own uh, willing, what they want to do, they can, but they, cho they chose very um, um, consciously to uh, spend, uh, to reserve a, a part of the, the, the financial, the, the money, yeah? To, um, to, to, to give to, to organizations that can um, come and create and use the organization uh, um, like they want um, to make their own art. So it's, it's like not, not them saying, oh, we'll open up our house and we'll give you a chance to, to perform or to do something. No, they say we have money, we have the house, we have the infrastructure, we have the personnel, you can use it as you like. And so they work now with uh, three, three or four um, artistic companies um, from the city and they and the, those like a toolbox, you know, they, they just uh, say we're here for you and uh, you can use uh, our resources. Um, we will not ask questions about what are you um, programming? What are you making? Um, but, but you can be here and, and we are uh, kind of uh, sharing the, the, the money, sharing the power so that they can uh, do what they want to do. And that is quite radical. It's, it's one of the things that can work. Um, it's really, um, it, it's not talking, it's really taking the power and, say, and saying, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that with you uh, because I have access to that uh, and I will share it with you. Uh, one of the other things that I think is also working, but unfortunately, when we talk about that, a lot of uh, organizations are very, uh, not very, um, how to say it, uh, eager, is a quota. If you use quota in personnel and in what you program and so on and so forth, you can also have a, a change. I don't know if you, you are aware of the fact that we in Belgium, we have uh, this law that obliges political parties to, to, to reserve a certain amount of electable places for women. So that really works. Um, and we are trying to, to, to really um, push also that, that idea that when you really want to change your personnel and you have to put some uh, quota in uh, your organization. Thank you, Rashida. I see a message of there that the breakout rooms are closing, and I also see the number going up. So I think the majority have already returned to the main room, right? So yes. I hand back to you <laughs> to the follow up. Yes, time uh, for the panel, and I'll, I'll hand over to Anne to lead us into that. Yes. So uh, I was jumping a little bit around because it seemed that there were a few issues, but I hope, Ian, that everything worked out in your session. Uh, and, uh, and I was following myself a really nice session as well. And Belinda, I hope your session also went well. Uh, now we have the opportunity to uh, bring on board our panelists. Uh, and I think, um, I was mentioning a small task for each panelist. Um, I was actually asking for a specific case. That's an opportunity. It's, you can grab it or you can decide to reflect on what happened in the breakout session. Now, I would like to, um, to invite uh, uh, Ian, uh, no, sorry, to invite Rashida as the first speaker in the, uh, in the panel. Are you prepared, Rashida, or would you like to reflect a little bit or on what happened or the stage is all yours? Thank you. So um, what I wanted to share with you is, um, so perhaps I would um, tell a bit about the um, Performing Arts uh, Social Fund. Um, you know, that's where I work as a coordinator 
on a specific uh, trajectory on inclusivity and diversity. So we, we offer um, uh, organizations in the performing arts a, a trajectory of a few years, uh, three uh, to four years, to, to help them, coach them, um, to, find, to, to find other ways of working and be more inclusive, have more diversity in their organization and so on. And, I, and we do it on the, on the four Ps that uh, Nike also spoke about. Um, so um, we are um, an organization that is so um, uh, helping um, the field of the performing arts um, and we are situated in the Flemish community. Um, it's an organization run by uh, employers and uh, workers organizations. Um, what we, we also um, did last year, a year, year ago, and I think it's a very important thing, uh, is that we have concluded uh, a, um, how to say it, an, a CAO, a collective labor agreement in the, in the field, in the field of the performing arts. So everyone involved in that field has uh, signed that, that collective uh, labor agreement. It's not only on the Flemish side, but it's also on the, on the, on the federal level. So it's a binding agreement on non-discrimination. So non-discrimination on, on, on um, not only on the basis of, of race or uh, um, nationality, uh, ethnicity, uh, but also on the on the base of ability, uh, gender, and so on. So that agreement has been signed and has uh, some some key points for this agreement is um, the commitment to combat uh, so all forms of discrimination and trans transgressive uh, behavior. And in that agreement is also the commitment to actively work out some tools and action points to realize an inclusive uh, policy in the organizations and work out equal labor uh, participation. So um, we are now um, working um, on this collective labor agreement to, as to develop really concrete action points so that the organizations are able to implement that uh, uh, agreement uh, in their practice and in their policies. Uh, so, for instance, they, we work out tools to create safe spaces, we work our tools to um, have a kind of uh, policy around uh, the reception of new uh, workers. Um, we think about reasonable accommodation that we could uh, implement and so on. So, um, together with that, there is another thing that we are doing as fund, as the social fund. That is that we have been asked by the Flemish government and the Flemish um, labor department to conduct uh, a, a zero measurement. So I'm not sure if that is a correct translation because I googled it. Null mating is zero measurement. <laughs> Do you understand me? <laughs> so uh, yeah. the idea is starting really at zero. Yeah. Zero measurement. Yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea is to really, um, yeah, lo look at our sector, at our field, and see who is working there. What are the profiles of the, the people who, who are working there? Uh, what age? What ethnicity? What color of skin? What gender? So, and I think it's a very good starting point because although we have been talking about inclusivity and, and equality uh, during many, many, many years, we're still at the beginning, you know? So, and the beginning is always, what is the situation now? You know, you can only change a situation if you are aware of what is the current situation, where are the lacks and how can we, we change things? What do we need to, to, to make it better? So that is what we're going to do now. Um, this is an assignment that has been given to us. We're still struggling in looking how we can do this zero, zero measurement. Um, um, but in, in, in any case, we will be looking at gender and ethnicity and, and so, so on and so on. So, and of course, um, beside that, we have the, that trajectory that I have already mentioned that scan and do that is um, similar to what Nikkei um, explained in her PowerPoint presentation. Um, and we try also to empower people 
artists uh, um, by giving them uh, you know, form, form, um, trainings and by giving them um, a direct line to, 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 to people who can help on the uh, administrative way on a, a helping in um, filing for funding and so forth and so on and so, so forth. So that is in a nutshell what, what, what we do as, a, as, a, as an organization. Ashida, can I ask you in terms of Nika's um, point about who is actually in the positions and we need to share or we need to shift a little bit or we need to, to go deeper into the structural uh, depth of, of the organizations. How does that appeal to uh, the tools that uh, you have developed? Is it too complicated? How do you see? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I see you get the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it, it is, of course, you know, it, you have to, to go into in, in depth um, of, of an organization to if you really want to make uh, uh, how to say dur durable uh, changes, you know, you, you cannot just go on the performative side and, and, and try to change little small things in, that have no really that are not anchored in the organization. So you have to really change the, the, the way the organization is, is doing things. And, um, and that is not easy. Of course, it's not easy because um, it means, you know, Nikki, Nikki also talked about, you know, if you talk about change and doing things differently, the question is always asked. The fear is always there. Uh, what does it mean for me? Do I have to Shall I, shall I lose my, my place? Shall I lose my, my power? But there is also something else that is uh, in this sphere. And it, I think it's even bigger than the idea of losing your, your, your place. It's shall I lose my identity? That is also one thing that is really very hard. You know, if we go into organizations and we talk about um, do things differently, uh, open up, then the question is, yeah, but what about the identity of the organization? Because we are an art organization. We want to, uh, to, to program art with a capital A that is quality, that has a certain quality. Um, so you have to um, explain that it does not mean that if you open up, that it does not mean that you will have to give in on quality uh, or uh, anything else, but we cannot guarantee that your identity will not change. Probably it will change, but that doesn't mean that it will change for the worse. You know, you can you can become something better. I just uh, wrote a comment in the chat that your identity is your power uh, mm -hmm. because I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Ashida, and um, it's it's also something that I. Uh, I notice when you talk to someone, okay, so what is it that you fear of losing or maybe not losing? And it, it's happening in our society as well, you know, when we talk about the influx of, of refugees, of people with a different uh, uh, background into a country that hasn't been looking like that for maybe some years, and then now everything is changing and they are afraid to lose their Dutch uh, identity or their German, wh whatever the identity is, um, uh, people really, really value this. And the same mechanism happens in an organization because people work and think and look kind of the same and, you know, it's very warm and everything is normal and everything is, it's, it's, it's going well enough for them. And then if someone comes in, this is also a, a remark for HR or people hiring. If someone new that doesn't look like the organization comes in, you can get very lonely or you can feel left out. And this is also a very big reason why people cannot keep them in the organization because they are so, everybody wants diversity. You hire one person who looks different in your company that is the same and uh, you cannot keep that person because you don't create a culture around everybody uh, mm -hmm. to, to be acceptable of this different person. So yeah, that's just what I wanted to add. 
Ian, how are you? How was your session? Uh, it's very good, and thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I think one thing I would just like to say in response to um, what uh, Nikki has just said, your identity is your power, is in my experience, it's also the source of the way that you're disempowered. Um, in the UK, for example, uh, the most marginalised, the most excluded group of um, workers in the sector are those that are deaf and disabled. Um, so whilst I agree that your identity can be a source of your power, politically, it may be the, fund that might be the primary reason why you're marginalised, excluded and disempowered as well. So I'm not saying that to kind of contradict that point, but I think in the experience of equity in the UK, I think the um, identity is a, a, a key point at which people become stereotyped, marginalised and excluded. Just, so just, just, that, just that initial point, Anne, but just going back to the session earlier on, I think there's a number of things that were covered. Um, one of the last points that I was making about challenging um, bias and stereotyping is um, considering what evidence that you have that proves that that's taking place. Because no production company is going to admit that its output is based on stereotyping and bias. Um, because most production companies will assume we are ethical, we are moral, uh, we work to high standards. So a, a key question I think for everyone here is how do you make material, how do you evidence that bias and stereotyping exists across the live performance sector? And so uh, uh, an example, I'm just going to put an example in the chat of um, um, because from a negotiating point of view, in terms of addressing this, you are going to have to prove um, this is a, it is a real issue um, because production companies are going to deny that this is an issue at all. That, that's one key thing. I think the other thing that I would say that we discussed in the group is that this is a, the issue of bias and stereotyping is uh, one that must be addressed holistically. So it's not just about evidence, evidencing that there is a problem. It's also about looking at the production process in its entirety. And it, so it is about commissioning. Who decides what gets produced? Because at that point, ideas of bias and stereotyping get introduced and they become um, embedded within a production at the stage of writing. So taking the production process apart is fundamentally important in identifying what key stage you're going to address. So for example, whilst we look at all of those stages in our work uh, in the UK, uh, we also spend a lot of time addressing the way in which casting reinforces stere stereotypical um, portrayal and representation. So one of the things I will put in the chat just now is um, the manifesto for casting that equity is negotiated in the UK that raises significant standards around um, improved diverse representation and portrayal. I think the, the last thing I just want to say, and comes back to the issue of unconscious bias. Um, and I think a perspective that we have in the UK, um, and it's something that you touched upon in the email that you sent to me yesterday, is that the problem, unconscious bias has a role. It's a small role, but it has a role nonetheless. Because the problem with unconscious bias, the concept of it, um, is, is in effect a trick. The idea that an individual is at fault and you can blame the individual for the way that they think does not resolve the overall issue. Um, the individual needs to be placed in the context of the belief systems that their own thinking is based on so that they can understand what it is that drives their unconscious bias because otherwise they're just sitting in a vacuum. So if, you, if we are going to look at the role of unconscious bias, it has to be placed within the overall context of the structural discrimination that exists uh, within the live performance sector so that individuals can 
properly understand how they should change uh, their thinking to have a direct impact on their particular uh, positions of power within the within the sector. So, and overall, a really interesting session um, and a, a number of uh, issues touched upon. So, Draval is asking, how about the criticism issue? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, one thing just to add um, is that one of the ways that we've addressed um, the issue of bias and stereotypes uh, in the UK is through um, a, 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 an allied issue, which is to do with the role of critics and criticism. A long-standing problem that we've had in the UK um, to, that reinforces bias and stereotypes relates to the role of theatre critics. Feeling very comfortable in attacking women, in attacking people based on their ethnicity and basically saying you should not be doing what you're doing you should not be you should not be portraying that role so one of the things that we've done over a 12 month period was that we worked with our sister union the national union of journalists which is the union for theatre critics and we worked with a wide body of theatre critics to devise guidance for critics on, a uh, on avoiding bias and stereotypes in your writing um, and it's designed to be an educational tool for critics. It's not designed to beat them up. It's basically be des designed to be something that um, enables critical reflection on your role, on your privilege. So, for example, it talks about the idea that there is no fundamental degree of objectivity everybody brings into their view, their lived experience. And that it's really important, this is where unconscious bias is relevant, it's really important to ask critics what it is that drives you, that informs you, um, whether you are the right person to critique a particular piece of theatre that you're wholly unfamiliar with. Whilst it's educative, uh, one of the things that we are encouraging our members to do, particularly those that receive um, biased discriminatory reviews is to complain more so um, it is both an educational tool for critics but it's but it also draws a line in the sand for our members to say that um, uh, unfair discriminatory reviews of your work are simply unacceptable and um, it took a while and as I say but it's I think it's quite a good piece of work and um, um, it's, it's particularly important for our members because it signals the, um, the desire of their union to address the issue of bias and stereotyping. Our uh, last one is uh, Belinda Steve. So in, in our group we uh, obviously saw there is a need for change and uh, the best way I invented this method which I will demonstrate in a second but if this is something that is uh, implemented in, say, every production of a performing arts as mandatory, they just have to do it. It just becomes the routine before you start uh, casting and rehearsals. You work with this method and with that, you can uh, change uh, the play you're going to be working with as regards gender and diversity. And then this is what we also discussed in the group just now. How far could it go? How far should it go? Would it make a difference? And so on. So uh, because I suppose most of you aren't aware of Neuropa, I will quickly just uh, show you what it's about. So my method is called Neuropa, which is, you see, it's always the first two letters, ne neutral role parity. And if you see this little image of a production, you see female roles, you see male roles. I switch the colors to keep your eyes awake and the green ones are the neutral ones. Um, the, the aim of this method is to incre uh, increase the proportion of women in a script, in a play, in a novel, in a game, in anything, in a, in a group, in a body, and then diversify the cast or whatever the, the people you are using. And while doing this, you're sensitizing uh, the people who are doing it, this team who's doing it, and you're raising awareness for this issue. So these people will go about their business differently after they've worked with this method. 
because they had to think about their blind spots, their, their own uh, unconscious bias or the situation um, of representation. Okay, so how does it go? So this is your play. These are all the characters starting top left. This is your leading character. And so you have a, a, a play with, um, how many is it? Uh, 16, 16 roles. First, uh, oh, sorry, you have a group of three who are involved in this production in different departments. They are given the task of doing Neropa. And first, on their own, they mark the characters, how they are written. That's the next slide showing you uh, these are the men, these are the women. This is how it is written, by their names, by their pronouns. So this is just how they are written. And in the next step, they determine, that's supposed to be green, they determine the neutral roles, the roles that don't have to be male, that could be any gender. And as I said, it's a group of three, so they will come up with different characters, different green roles, different neutrals, because this is not a science. There is no right or wrong. It's your opinion based on your experience, your unconscious bias or whatever. So it's good that it's a group of three because then they meet afterwards, compare their greens, their neutral roles, try to convince the others, oh yes, please, uh, this role is definitely a neutral role because then you do some research and say, yes, but this, this character, of course, uh, doesn't have to be a man or somebody else will say, yes, definitely, because that's how it is written in the play. It needs to be a man because of this father-son scene or whatever. So they agree on their final neutral role and they are switched starting with the biggest role to woman, men, woman, men, woman, men. So now you see, instead of having 12 male, four female roles, you have now nine male roles and seven female roles. It's still the same story. It's still the same script. You're not changing it radically. You're just uh, determining which are the neutral roles and those you can change. So this is your play. And the next step, of course, is you're starting with the auditioning and who will be your uh, actors and actresses actually playing. And there, the person doing or persons doing it, they have the task to diversify. Does this character have to be uh, young, white, good looking, blah, blah, blah? Yes, it's in the play. Okay, then the person stays like this. But if not, diversify it, see what is the situation of the play, in what part of society is it, in what region, whatever, and diversify it. So um, yeah, that's basically the concept. So we have two questions for the first way to gender thing you ask, does this character have to be male? If the answer is no, it's neutral. It's not female, it's neutral. And then because of this parity thing, you switch them. And the other question is, does this character have to be white, young, good looking, able-bodied, slim, middle-class, non-pregnant or whatever? That's what I call the fine tuning in the casting process. And if the answer again to these questions is no, then you mark the roles and they, uh, you make a big effort to, to cast as diverse actors and act actresses as possible. Sorry, this is, because it was originally designed for film production, showing you in the pre-production, when the script is sort of ready, you do this Neuropa check, that's your team of three. And in film, it would be the casting director who does the fine tuning. And I can say for Germany, they would be very happy because they're always unhappy that they're not allowed to suggest diverse casts because they have to uh, deliver the usual, that's what people like. And of course, this concept, the concept of the neutral roles can also be applied while you write a script, because then you write your new characters and as long as it's not necessary for them to have a certain gender, you leave them as neutral. And that way you will get, from the start, you will get more female characters. I've tried to do it for a theater production. So of course you have also the process of writing new plays where you can apply this concept and then again, you also have your Neuropa check and maybe there could also be the ones doing, starting on the fine tuning. Usually it, it will probably be the director who says who, who gets, who's doing the casting. So you have those two steps in a theater production as well. Okay, so I just to have two examples. This uh, used to be a theater play, the front page, it was turned into a film. It's a, a play basically about two male journalists and through some mishaps, 
during the casting process, when actor didn't turn up, the director of this film decided to turn this leading character into a woman. So now it turned into a film, His Girl Friday, of a male and a female journalist, which worked very well. I haven't found information that people are doing actually the play with this switch, but uh, okay. And another uh, play, it used to be a TV play, then a stage play, then a film called uh, 12 Angry Men about a jury of uh, a murder case or yeah, uh, of 12 mm -hmm. men. And as you can see here, it's 12 men. It's 12 men, mainly white, but it's all men. And this film was made in 1957. At that time, for 20 years, women had been allowed on juries and also for even a longer time, um, uh, black people had been allowed on juries. So that was a bit strange that they did this film. But what I find, yeah, there was a civil rights act even in the 19th century that allowed uh, black people on juries. And the next slide shows you a film that was made 40 years later of the same story. Uh, so they had uh, four black men, but, but still they had 12 men. And this is just to show you why I find it so important to have not gender as a category of diversity, but do it first, because otherwise you just diversify the men and you still have no women. Right, this is my where you can find more on the method and my blog and so on. Um, so if this well, obviously, at the moment, people can use it, the method, and work with it, and they do both in film and in theater, but it could be made mandatory that every production just works with it, and suddenly you have, you can change the place that already exists and make them uh, more diverse and have them move towards more uh, gender equality. So that's basically the idea of this, uh, this method. Well, this method has been, um, for example, I've, I've been uh, in several uh, times, been in the UK and in Ireland on invitation of equity uh, to present the method. And every time people approach me and said, yes, I've used it in my play, I'm using it on my film. So at the moment, it's people using it voluntarily. And there have also been some, I would say, big film people in Germany who also work with the method. But the next step should be that it should be made mandatory because it can be a very positive, positive, popular thing because it's so easy to do. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of time and it makes, uh, it makes change. And at the moment, this is what all the talk is about, but not the action. So for example, in Germany, you could say everybody who gets public money for a theater production or the theater in general uh, or musical production, you have to work with this method. And if the answer is after this check that all characters have to be male and all characters have to be white because the story is like this. Okay, then it's the story and it's possible if you make an opera about uh, the voting for, for the Pope, the chances are that all roles will be men and uh, a lot of them will be white. But maybe you don't want an opera on that. Maybe then you say, okay, we're not using this story. We're taking some other story. And in most stories, you will find neutral roles and you will find the, the open window to more diversity. Uh, when I started, it used to be the question, does this character have to have the gender it has? But what you come up with is if you're unlucky, you have even less female roles. Because mm. very often, yeah, so, yeah. So, but, yeah. but the aims, that's why it's so nice that it's called Gender Equality Thursday. We want more female roles. And when we talk about bias and so on, um, if you have roles that were written for a man and now they're ter turned into women, chances are much slimmer that they're stereotypical because they weren't written as women. They were written as men, defined as neutral. Now they're a woman. So, of course, I can challenge all the female roles as well. But we may not come up with more roles for women and we need to see more women. We don't need to see only 25% or 30% or of the characters women. Once this is it, it, it changed, then we can talk about uh, challenging all the characters. But at the moment we have this great disparity. So that's why I changed the question to, does this character have to be male and not, it used to be, does this character have to have the gender it has? That was the starting question, yes. Linda, did it have any impact on, um, 
on audiences? Diversity in audiences, do you see any impact at all? Any positive impact? Is it a threat? Does it have like a larger outreach effect? Oh God, that's with? really hard to say. I mean, how, how could I measure, measure that? Because for example, a play or, or a film that's been made with Neuropa, we don't have the comparison. We don't have the same film cast with more male roles and less diversity. So I cannot really compare it. I would definitely say yes, because all the surveys say, if it's closer to reality, i.e. not so biased in one direction, it will be more attractive. But then when you look at films or plays that are really attractive, uh, that is very often not the kind of art I want to produce. So this question of what gets the highest rating when you look at some of the films, uh, yeah, but is that the thing that we, that I personally think we need to bring us forward and to tackle the issues? I don't know. Belinda, thank you very much. It's very, very, very interesting. And it's, it's a, it seems even like a very creative tool in a way. It really goes deep into uh, reflections and, and playing around with this neutralization matter. It's very, very attractive. So it's now nice. I would like... And when, sorry, one thing. When I do the workshops, I even use these little plastic figures. So you have your play and you set it you out. And people yeah. love this. People love this to work. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>